Welcome to Run With It, the show that brings you untapped business ideas from successful entrepreneurs. My name is Chris Justin, and I'm here with Ethan Jenny. Ethan, how are you doing today? I mean, I'm just like going on this theme of, you know, we're all one, you know. I've been listening to a little bit too much like Eckhart Tolle, you know, on YouTube when I'm going to sleep or something. Power of now. We're all just one consciousness, and I am you and you are me, and we are both Clint Lotz, and somehow that goes back to a Beatles song as well. <laughs> I am the walrus. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> Clint Lotz is our guest today on the show. <laughs> he is the founder of trackstar.ai, which seems pretty interesting, provides machine learning technology to lenders that uncovers future borrowing patterns and therefore potentially new revenue for those lenders. And that uses sort of existing data that they have on their customers. So he's here, though, to talk about a business idea he's bringing to us. But first, yeah, let's let's welcome you, Clint. Well, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. So you're bringing us this idea essentially to teach or train people to use video call platforms, which that's been a huge issue over the last year. Of course, everyone has their stories of seeing people do inappropriate things on Zoom calls or, or Google Meets. And uh, it's surprising to me that this is an issue, but there's a huge opportunity there. 78% of corporate companies use video calling software. It takes a tremendous amount of time for a large percentage of these companies to bring their staff up to speed. Not to steal too much of your thunder, Clint, tell us, tell us what made you come up with this idea. You know, I learned a long time ago that not everybody wants to sit through and read a manual. Most people want a shortcut. We all want a shortcut. We all want to learn as fast as we can and go with, you know, breakneck pace. And what I've also learned is that people are willing to pay for that information. And that's where this idea came from, right? We, we all heard, as you mentioned, the issues and the, and the incidents, if you will. But it, there's a big part of what happened during the pandemic, especially that you know forced everybody to adopt digital digital communication tools but there's still that lack of understanding for a lot of the workforce not everybody who works in large corporations is familiar and comfortable using zoom as an example or any other video platforms but there's that's multi multi-purpose to this because there's security there's uh you know, kind of best practices that are involved as well, too, that you should have tips and tricks, do's and don'ts. But mostly, I think part of it is training people how to use the tools so that they feel confident. That's really the end goal is you want to be able to educate a user on how to feel like they're a pro when it comes to using these video tools that they're not familiar with before. I'm kind of like short and long on this. On the one hand, uh, I've done some stuff that's sort of along these lines. I've helped people create Zoom events and help them produce it, help facilitate it. I have to say, I have been more on the side of like not trying to make them feel like a pro, but just trying to avoid all like to predict all of the snafus that are going to happen and then just make them not have to worry about knowing how to do it. Like, but that's very hard. But the one thing that the reason I'm like, I'm questioning it right now. I literally just host helped someone host a Zoom event couple days ago. And it was the same group that I ho helped them host a Zoom event a year ago. And I have to say, it was like a totally different experience. The first one, everybody was like, oh, cool. Like, it's the first time we ever did a Zoom event. Hey, we pulled it off. You know, like this all went great. And, oh, this is awesome. And this next one was like, yeah, that was impressive. We were able to do that. But oh man, I can't wait until we get out and just have real events because that was hard. And that wasn't exactly what I wanted it to be. So I'm wondering, I'm starting to like have second thoughts about, you know, how much to invest into like video conferencing software. Now that ostensibly people are getting back to normal and the pandemic's over, I'm wondering if this is all just going to be a distant memory and people are just going to get offline in droves. I don't think that that's going to be the case. I think that the use cases for video software have still not been tapped out. You think about the creative applications like that app that allows blind people to phone someone who can see and help them find whatever the flower in their pantry, right? There are, that is a, a 
type of video communication that hasn't become mainstream yet. And that's a little bit different. It's very different than the idea that we're talking about here. But I think applications like that are, they're not mainstream yet. And they should be, they will be in five years. So, so Clint, what's your, uh, you know, what's your best video conferencing experience? What's your worst? Can you think of any? <laughs> uh, well, without throwing myself <laughs> under the bus too much. Without naming yes. names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, without naming names, i.e. my own. There's been quite a few times, mostly it's interruptions, you know, where you are background noises or, I mean, I don't have kids, I have dogs, so they've made several appearances on Zoom calls. And to your point earlier, I, I think, I think you're, you're right, Chris, there's, there's still more to go for video, but you also have to think of like the business aspect to it. Do I put my rep on a plane to go meet somebody for the first time? Or do we schedule their team and our team on a series of Zoom calls to knock this out, right? And I think that's where businesses are really seeing the the benefit. But for my own experience, I've I've definitely had a couple of of snafus. I uh, when I first started, I I gotten the the camera and it wasn't secured, so I was literally in the middle of a call and the camera falls off, <laughs> literally falls to my desk. That was an interesting call. Um, still close nice, that congrats. deal, I might add, which was which is kind of a, a silver lining to it. But yeah, there's definitely some practice that needs to happen before you get into it, which is really why I kind of yeah. came up with the idea. By the way, on the note of closing that deal, I may have brought this up on the podcast before, but I still think it's, it's an interesting example. Um, I, I don't know. I forget what book it came from. But there's an example where they actually did an experiment. They had two people give the same lecture. I, or maybe it was even the same person give the same lecture and they both spilled tea. No. Yeah. They both spilled tea on themselves in the middle of the lecture. And it was like, Oh, what a klutz I am. Right. But the one lecture did a bad job with the lecture and the other person did a good job. The person with the bad job got really poor ratings than if they hadn't spilled the tea, like worse ratings than if they had spilled. They're just like, Oh, this person's a bad teacher. They're also a klutz person who was actually a pretty good teacher and they spilled the tea they got better ratings and, and like the theory behind this is like it gives people empathy for you so who knows maybe dropping that phone actually helped you close the deal right yeah that'd be in the bonus section of the training <laughs> the bonus section of the training <laughs> that <laughs> really closed the deal <laughs> yeah now i think um, so i'm always fascinated when a guest brings an idea like this out there i get really curious because on the surface it sounds very simple and of course you're Super sharp guy, trackstars.ai does something way more complicated than than Ethan and I could understand. Maybe Ethan's got it. I don't know. I got but, it all figured out. I've, I'm, I'm launching trackstars.io tomorrow. <laughs> this idea, this idea is one that I I would not I would never think about. I was just like ah, people are yeah, people will figure it out. They're uh, they've had a year of practice now, more than a year of practice, getting good at this. The workforce is only going to get younger. Young people in general are just better at doing this. You have all these people that can train folks within the workforce. It doesn't take a ton of time to get up to speed on this. And I mean, this is speaking to someone, I'm 34 years old, so I'm kind of you know in between there. How do you think about this idea and the opportunity given like, what is the difference between the way you're looking at this problem and what I just described? Because you're looking at it at the point of entry only. So training people how to be successful on video calls is the entry point. What you don't realize is that there is an entire market that we're not even addressing here that could be training any type of PC training. It could be based on Zoom. It could be based on any type of application or software that you actually want to use. But what's the hot topic right now? Zoom. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I, I really like the way you're thinking about that just as an entry point. I think this idea, it speaks to the broader goal of helping knowledge workers be more productive, which there's a huge opportunity there. That's something that we've kind of just happened into this current way of working, asynchronous communication. I can rant on this all day. I'm very much aligned with Cal Newport's way of thinking about this. He's got a, a book out there now called A World Without Email. I think that there is tremendous opportunity in helping train organizations to be more productive with today's tech tools. 
So interestingly enough, Zoom actually has their own consulting services that is a part of their revenue stream. Um, I didn't get into researching how much this accounts for, but just to give us an idea of, and this is a, a more for like bespoke uh, consulting, not, not sort of like pre-recorded trainings and things like that, but it's $300 an hour for standard support if you, if you want that. They also have premium support for $400 an hour. They have a sort of a production assistance uh, where they assist you with a dedicated production specialist for $4,000, starting at $4,000. They have a technical producer package where it's $10,000, right? So there's definitely a relatively good precedent for, at least with Zoom and things like this, this kind of uh, a revenue stream. You know, if they've got the one sheet on it, they've probably got customers as well. This is a good time to talk about pricing in general for this idea. Clint, you shared some some ideas for how to price a solution like this. Well, you want to create a, a stair step, right? You want people to be able to engage with you at a, at a low dollar amount, say under $100 a month, right? Think of it mostly as a subscription basis. For the most part, people love that because then they can do it on their own or they can schedule time with you. I like having a subscription basis be- for multiple reasons, of course, but... For the consumer, it makes sense because then it's always available to them. And I like I like keeping it smaller dollar amounts, you know, like say $99 a month as an example. So you have that. But then if you bring on, you know, 100 of your employees, we cut you a break, of course. And so it's you need to start small, right? Because then you can get to the masses. And if Zoom is charging hundreds of dollars to, to do this, 99 bucks is inexpensive. But you also have to have additional value that's added to it. So it's not just me or a bunch of videos for 99 bucks. You need to be a lot more engaging. And that's where your marketing can come into play. That's really where a lot of your, your budget is going to go, is keeping all of those subscribers engaged, keeping them informed. And walking them through a certification process, as an example. People love, and during the pandemic, people love to learn. Tell us about the action steps that you would take to get this going. Testing your idea, right? So you start running these um, consulting platforms. You can hire somebody you know, for an hour if you wanted to. You start promoting yourself on those. Start creating some of this content, this material, and test it out. See how it's working. You're saying that you would uh, be, get on one of these consulting platforms and see if someone would pay you for some of this training that you put together. Do you mean getting on Upwork or something like that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and interesting, you know, there's also, I don't think we spoke it specifically, but like YouTube channels, right? That's a place where you could just start creating content and, you know, in some senses, it doesn't always matter if anybody's watching as long as you're as long as you're making some useful things and you've got a little exercise going, like even with the podcast, you know, Chris and I have been doing a podcast for over a year and a half or maybe around a year and a half. And at first it's just like, let's put the episodes out there, you know, and just get them out there. And then over time you build an audience. And so, so that's an avenue, but I did want to call out a sort of an interesting story about how, you know, sometimes these things work and sometimes they don't. Um, so at the same time that you need to remain to committed to something, um, there's also times at which things take off and it's good to like notice when things are going to take off or not. There's a podcaster um, who calls herself Grammar Girl now. She started podcasting in like, you know, kind of like pop science, you know, like sort of longer episodes, uh, teaching people about some popular science thing that's going on. And it did okay, right? And all of a sudden she said, you know, I'm going to start this grammar podcast. They're going to be like five or 10 minutes long. And I'm just going to say something interesting about grammar. You know, like where, how do you use this word in the right context? Or right? what's the difference between this version of this word and this version of that? It took off. I mean, it took off. And these were like five to 15 minute episodes, like didn't take a lot of input. She built up a catalog. All of a sudden, you know, publishers are reaching out to her and asking her to write a book with all these grammar tips in it. It really turned into something. So I think it's important to have like a sensitivity around what you start, right? Like if, if you, you got to notice some traction as you're doing this, or it would be helpful to like hold out probably a little bit. This particular niche, you would expect there to be some traction, right? If you have it, cause, cause people need 
you know, Zoom assistants. And if for whatever reason you're like YouTube channel or whatever avenue you started to try to do it, it's not really hitting, you know, within the first few months, you might want to switch directions. I want to throw out a completely opposite approach. Thinking about selling into a large company, I used to work at Shell. And in order to get the training content at Shell is very closed off. Absolutely no chance you're going to go to YouTube to learn how to do something. I, I don't even, I don't know if today you can access YouTube on Shell computers. They have dedicated training platforms with corporate branded videos. I, it doesn't have to be corporate branded, but corporate approved videos. They're never as good at content as content as you would find on YouTube, for example, but they are safe. <laughs> People have made sure that they're not going to, uh, you know, get get access to your computer or somehow get you to get you to share your personal information and somehow hack into the system. Although I guess Solar Winds figured that out or <laughs> got caught up in that. But anyway, the creating content from that angle is completely different. You have to start and you have to sell into an organization like that. That's probably a long sales cycle. You need to, you know, know the connections to have. It's probably a much higher return. Uh, to do something like that, but it's the the primary skill that I'm picturing there is selling into an organization and not necessarily creating the content. Yeah, I think that's not a bad idea because you know I really see a lot of this like the pricing differences that you can find with people that sell directly to corporations. You can you can get a lot more than if you're just asking someone to make a donation to your you know uh, Patreon channel or something like that, right? So I like that angle of that for sure. And then, I mean, if you could potentially build yourself a resource where multiple corporations could access it, maybe it'd be easy to rebrand it or something like that, right? Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll create the general content. We'll make sure it's good, but your logo can go up in the corner so that people know that it's you know within your organization and we'll be in charge of all the security and make sure this is a platform where people can't get in hack and hack in and out and things like that and make sure it's all, you know, whatever, it's not going to offend anybody or, and, and it complies with all, we'll make it boring, put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is a, a bit of a tangent and different idea uh, from one that we have talked about in the past of enterprise software in general. There is a page on Y Combinator request for startups. Enterprise software is number 10 on there. And it says software used by large companies is still awful and still very lucrative. So Y Combinator is looking for people who are specifically going and solving problems in, in the uh, enterprise uh, big company world. This seems like a perfect fit. Getting into big organizations is difficult. But building your brand from the beginning is how you accomplish that. Zig Ziglar, you've probably heard about him before. He was big, you know, sales training guy for automotive dealerships. My uncle owned a dealership when I was a kid. He actually owned a bunch of them. So I heard about him way back when I was young. He went up, he, he was actually doing, he, building his brand for 10 years before Ford Motor Company hired him for a million dollars a year to do their training videos. It takes sometimes a lot of effort before you really see a breakthrough. And since then, I mean, I was just, you know, multi-million dollar and appearance fees and all that other stuff. But that's the end goal of taking himself, right, marketing it and making it brandable and then turning it into something that he can monetize. I think that's a totally valid approach to to go that way and become just really good and build up your brand and... and have someone like Ford knocking on your door in order to bring you into the organization. Honestly, with the enterprise solutions, the shortcut is to figure out how to get in before you do all of that, because the software and the software that I used when I was at Shell, it's atrocious. I mean, it's, it's people used to, we used to have this uh, MOC procedure management of change. If you ever wanted to make a change in a refinery, you had to go through this entire work process, collect signatures. It was an online system that people have, and it's called the KMS knowledge management system. You could upload your documents. You could tag people to do approvals. That entire system was so bad that oftentimes people would print the entire 50 page management of change and go around and manually do it via paper 
instead of using the system that was in place. So I agree with you that you know one avenue is to is to build up your brand cachet and, and get in. Another one is to figure out how to sell and convince these folks that hey, your software is just so bad that I'm going to develop or or show you a better solution that you can use now. Maybe I don't have the brand recognition or the, the name, but your life is going to get better in six months or a year if you go with me. And you know, to jump on that, cloud computing has really facilitated that to you know the, the hundredth degree. I'm a perfect example of that, right? Without cost-effective, I should say inexpensive cloud computing available to the masses, that's how a big organization like that can, you like myself, could create an awesome piece of software that does what you're talking about and sell it to these big organizations because they can literally deploy it within a couple seconds in inside their own environment, inside their own comfort level. They know the pricing, they know everything, right? Oh yeah, I was just saying it was about time for our sponsor message uh, this episode is being brought to you by Shell. Uh, powering progress. <laughs> All right. Well, we've we've ripped on them quite a bit. So in action, uh, turning translating that into an action step, I wouldn't know, e even with my experience at Shell, I wouldn't know how to get in selling, but I would look to partner with someone else who has done enterprise sales before and at least pay them to advise me on how to approach this if if I were to take on the enterprise sales approach. Yeah, this would be a good good point. I don't know if we'll have much to say about it. Maybe Clint will have some experience. We haven't talked a lot about like sales cycles on this podcast, right? And I think that's something to be super aware of, right? Like they say that lower price products, of course, like the sales cycle could be pretty short, right? You can turn around like a $59 ebook or something and somebody might not even know about your brand for a week or a day or something like that. Versus when you're dealing with these larger corporations, like you kind of have to know that it's going to take, hey, man, it could take like six months. It could take two years if you're working on a particular deal. Um, so I know, Clint, you've worked with banks and I don't know if you have to like particularly engage with them in, in a sales process or they just sort of come across your, your product or something. But do you have any um, experiences in sort of sales cycles and what to expect? Yes. The bigger the organization, the more they're going to squeeze you. I'll put it that way. And what I mean by squeeze is scrutinize, right? As they should. They have a lot of, they have a lot to protect. And once you make, once you pass the sniff test, as we say, right, you, you, you get that initial meeting. Okay. We'll hear you out. That starts the clock. You can fast forward six months before a decision is made in my mind. That's what I do. It's usually faster. If it happens faster, awesome. But I'm giving it six months. Now, if it's a large organization, like an enterprise, big bank, add six months to go through their vendor verification procedures, which is so add six months to the original six months. So yes. now you got 12 months. Yes. Okay. You're about a 12 wow. month sales cycle is really what you're looking at. And you've had, had to go through those sales cycles yourself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it gets, it, 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 it's easy for us because, you know, we get the same requests for the same documentation to verify security and insurance and things of that nature. You know, they're just going through their due diligence. So for us, we have a whole packet and we have the, you know, the right team members available to their, to interface with their team. But it's, it's very time consuming, right? I mean, I'm ready to go. I can plug this thing in tomorrow. Like I said earlier, right? They can deploy it in their own environment and poof, away we go. Or, you know, we're off to the races. No risk, you know, no, we don't have to deal with any of this stuff. We, we can shorten that, that procurement process, if you will. And going back to cloud computing, that's, that has really helped a lot. And if you dig into the procurement process of cloud computing, you're dealing with organizations that are already using it. They're already big enough to have enterprise agreements with cloud providers. So they have budgets. They're already getting bills. If you can get on those platforms and be a seller on those platforms, you can cut that procurement process or the sales cycle from 12 months down to about three to four is really what you're looking at. So by getting on a platform that is recognized as an industry standard, you know, a, a reputable call provider, I'm not going to drop any names because I don't want anybody to get mad at me like Shell. But when you're on there it and you're dealing with the right people, they're like, oh, okay, well, you've already accomplished this or you've done, you know, all the steps to get this product to here and we're here. So we know what those steps are and, and how much it takes. The other thing about that is you can shorten that life cycle or that, that, that sales cycle 
substantially because those budgets are already created, right? If my product that I'm selling, my, you know, digital Zoom training, we'll call it that, and it's available, you know, for cloud computing application for your whole organization, if it's pricing is above what they've already got set for their fiscal budget for cloud computing, guess what? You're going to wait. You have to wait until the money's there. Yes, we want it. Yes, we want to go. We'll sign the agreement, but we can't get started until, and they'll tell you what quarter you are now budgeted in. And it does take time, but it's worth it. That's the key. It's, it's really, really worth it to go through all of that because you're building not only a relationship, but a business at the same time. So, so can you speak a little bit about starting a business where you kind of know that the sales cycle is going to be a while, like having the faith that you're going to at least wait for that first client, the sales cycle's worth of time, right? Like six months, 12 months or whatever. I learned that lesson the hard way. So I dug in and went for it, right? And I quickly realized that this isn't something that you can do on your own, or at least I thought. And so I started reaching out to my network. I started bringing on key players within the industry and people that could not only provide a value to the business, but open doors for the business and its product. That is vitally important. And to answer your question, it was someone who works for me, who had worked with them in a previous position, right? It's all about networking. You're going to find that when you're going after a vertical like lending, as an example, it's a very small world and they all kind of know who each other are. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that's a great tip, right? If, if I'm going to enter uh, a place, a space where I'm trying to sell and I don't know how, you know, like you said, you're an entrepreneur, you think entrepreneurially, I'm sure you know how to sell, right? But maybe it's maybe it's not your forte or what you want to work on 24-7 too. Like if you know somebody, for example, in Chris's say. Chris's case where he's talking about selling to Shell, um, you know, because in, in the best spirit possible with all this, he wants to improve the company, right? <laughs> but like, you know, there's going to be a salesperson who sells to Shell, you know, or, or there's going to be a person that sells training software to Shell, right? And if you can find that best salesperson who sells training software to Shell and get them on your team, then that sales cycle is going to shorten that way too. Well, we're coming up on time here. Clint, this has been really informative. Really appreciate you joining us. Where can listeners go to learn more about what you're up to? Trackstar.ai is our enterprise site and explains what it is that our date does. Thanks for the conversation, Clint. It's been a lot of fun. Enjoy the rest of your day. 